Good morning, everyone. I know I usually do the end, so you're not leaving yet. So just sorry about that. But I want to thank you for showing up this morning. Thank you for uh, making Bethel parking lot church service part of your day. And uh, so it's good to see everybody here. Good to see everybody taking advantage of the yard of the lawn over there, sitting down and relaxing and spending time together as we worship this morning. Um, I just have one quick announcement, and then we'll pray, and then we will get started. So June 28th, the elders and pastors have decided that we're going to do our best to start back at Bethel, meeting at the church again. And uh, so we just ask that you will be patient with them as they look to how we're going to corporately worship together back in the building. And there will be future emails for that as well. So pay attention for your emails. Um, I know for us, we got we had gotten tons of emails through LCA through the last three months, and it kind of like gets to be noisy. And uh, so just make sure that you keep an eye out for the Bethel emails to make sure that we see how we're going to move forward with our worship service back at back in our building. So let's have a quick word of prayer. We'll get started. Elijah will come up and lead us with some songs at this point. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for... Just another glorious Sunday morning that you've given to us to be able to be here and worship together in this atmosphere of corporate worship. I just ask, Lord, for your hand on Pastor Dave as he uh, preaches to us this morning, gives us your word. We thank you for just watching over the health of our pastors over the last few weeks as the struggles that they've had, that uh, it's good to see them all here and doing well. And thank you for meeting their physical needs over the last few weeks. And Lord, I just ask for your hand on our congregation as we work through these uh, little strange times and just ask for your comfort and guidance for our elders and our pastors as they uh, see how we get to worship together once again as a body back in our church. We thank you for uh, Faith Presbyterian as they've allowed us to use their parking lot the last few Sundays, and I just thank you for their uh, graciousness towards us. Lord, I just ask for a good hour this morning. Thank you for the talents that you've given to Elijah and being able to lead us in worship. And I ask, Lord, that you will just uh, be with us this morning and, and just grant us a great time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. All right, uh, we're going to start with Behold Our God. Um, I'm going to skip over that bridge section at the bottom, just a note. So uh, there's like dueling, echoing lines there, and my skills as a ventriloquist are not quite up to par yet to pull that off by myself. So we'll, uh, we'll just <laughs> leave that part off. held the ocean in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand the kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has given counsel to the Lord, who can question any of his words, and who can teach the one who knows all things, and who can fathom all his wondrous deeds, behold our God, seated on his throne, 
Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful men. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior risen now to reign. Peace. 
Well, again, good morning, church family. Good to see you all. Friends, visitors, those out in the Grove. We got to think of a cool name for that area over there, the Grove. Doesn't that sound good? I like that. Uh, welcome. We're very thankful that we can meet together. Uh, what, a, what a blessing God has given us, uh, except really for our first Sunday where we had to cancel due to the rain. God has been very good. Uh, we don't want to complain about the wind because he is the director and orchestrator of the wind itself. So we, we are thankful that he chooses to have it blow as he, as he wishes. Uh, this morning, let's turn our Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter 12. And we'll study the parable um, found there in this section. It's, uh, it's important that we remember that we're studying the parables that are exclusive to Luke. Uh, and what we mean by that is that they're not shared in the other uh, synoptic gospels. Matthew or Mark uh, do not record these, but Luke alone. So we're going to look at uh, some of these rather unique parables that most of us are probably familiar with, maybe from children's stories or maybe Sunday school, or maybe you've just studied the parables. Uh, but this one this morning, we're going to talk about rich toward God, rich toward God. Let's pray quickly, and then we'll dive into his, his word. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us as... Um, your people, your children, those who have been called out of the darkness and into the marvelous light to glean truth from your word. Lord, we thank you that it is an eternal truth spoken from the heavens to, to various men over centuries. Uh, Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit superimposed those men, that, Lord, you had them write exactly what you wanted them to write, though their own styles and personalities come out, their unique perspectives Lord, and we're thankful, Lord, that they teach us even now today. And Lord, this is an area where we must guard ourselves, as Jesus is going to remind us. Materialism, greed, uh, Lord, these things that seem to ensnare many today, even in the church, unfortunately. Even churches, not just individuals, but churches themselves, whole denominations have been captured by this. So Father, guide us, lead us, instruct us. Uh, we are desperate for you. We need you. Uh, God, we love you. Please teach us to love you more. Uh, Lord, we desperately desire to love our neighbor as ourselves. We can't do that apart from you. Uh, Lord, would your spirit prompt us to do uh, and look and search uh, for those whom we can set our affection upon. Uh, Lord, with the same vigor, uh, I pray the same anticipation, Lord, that you had when you set your affection upon us. Lord, we again love you in Christ's name. Amen. So in this parable, what we're going to find, Jesus is teaching about the emptiness of greed and the satisfaction of of being rich toward God. Stories told uh, regarding uh, greed. Uh, one early Monday morning, a church secretary hears the phone ringing and she picks up that phone to hear the following words. I would like to speak to the head hog at the trial. The secretary says, uh, excuse me, what, what did you say? The man gladly repeated himself and rather excitingly says, I would like to speak to the head hog at the trial. The lady says, well, I think you probably mean one of our pastors, lead or senior or youth. I don't think you mean to use those kinds of words. Usually you start this off with, a, with the phrase, I'd like to speak with the pastor. The man's taken aback in the call and he says, well, I had $75,000 I wanted to give to the church. 
There's silence on the other side of the phone for a moment, and the secretary replies with these words, hold the line, I think the big pig is coming in right now. Needless to say, money can change people. The thought of money can change people. In this parable, Jesus is going to declare clearly in the parable what are the consequences for following, chasing, pursuing greed, money, possessions, materials. One commentator says these words speaking on our current age. Some may state the Middle Ages, which were marked by monks, cathedrals, crusades, also an age of faith, and ours has been an age of unbelief. They concern themselves with the coming kingdom. Ours is concerned with the present age. If they were focused on the soul, ours is the body. If theirs was marked by the spiritual, ours has been focused on the material. He concludes with these words, I think it is safe to say at this juncture in history, our age is primarily concerned with the here and now and rampant materialism, stuff. What do I do to get stuff? How can I ensure that I have enough stuff? One would either live for that or live for pursuit of God's kingdom. Throughout the scriptures, we are warned about the unfortunate dangers of wealth. We are told throughout scripture that we are to aspire to greater things, the pursuit of God's kingdom. First Timothy tells us these words, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul concludes in verse 11 with these words, but flee from these things. The endless pursuit of wealth, the endless pursuit of more and more. Well, as we look here to this parable, I want to first give us the context of the parable before we begin to read through it. And it's amazing, brothers and sisters, and we have talked about this before, that the word of God or the teaching of the word of God reveals much about the person. It reveals much about what's going on inside the heart of the individual. Jesus, in the context here of Luke chapter 12, has been talking about some things that are very serious. He's been talking about deep spiritual truths, eternal matters. He's encouraging his disciples to remain faithful in light of the potential and future danger that they were to face. They were told not to worry about what life is going to bring and how they were going to defend themselves because Christ would work through them by his spirit. Then out of nowhere, we pick up with verse 13. Someone in the crowd, we're not told who this individual is. We're not given any insight into his financial portfolio. We don't know what side of the tracks he's from. We simply know that he asked this question, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Seemingly out of nowhere, I'm talking about issues that pertain, pertain to life and godliness and how to endure. Christ is teaching these things, and this person asks this question, makes this statement. Tell my brother to divide this. Notice his language. You're telling the master, you're calling teacher, rabbi, yet you're telling him what to do. One commentator says this consuming passion for resolving the inheritance dispute is an indication of a deeper spiritual problem that needed to be urgently addressed. In other words, forget everything that you're talking about, Jesus. I need you to handle my issue. Isn't that so foreign to us? Like, I can't wrap my mind around that. I've never been there before because I'm so fixated on the Savior that my issues never come to light. I speak as a foolish man. We all do that, don't we? We all seem to jettison at times what Christ may be saying to us, what he may be telling us to do. And we think about, but what about me and my world and the situation that I'm in? This man completely missed the mark, the teaching, the clear teaching of verses 1 through 12. We are told that God has numbered the very hairs on our head. I shaved my head the other day. God knows how many were in the sink. There were some there. So enough for you smarties, smart Alex. There were some hairs there. God knew how many were there. He is unfazed by the ministry of Christ. He's unfazed by the working potentially of the spirit that's going on in his own life. He doesn't seize the moment to talk about issues that pertain to the, to, to the world to come. He is talking about the here and now. 
Some would say that this is a rude question. I don't care about this spiritual stuff. Just give me stuff that is going to work in my life now. J.C. Ryle says these words, how many are incessantly planning and scheming about things of time, even under the very sound of the things of eternity. Isn't that true? We get so focused on the here and now. What's in this for me right now? Calvin says this is a common disease. Those who ignore Christ's teaching and only are interested in their personal welfare. This man clearly displays that I'm only concerned about right now. He seeks one thing and one thing alone. I want the portion of my inheritance. And look, notice Jesus' response there in verse 14. But he said to him, he being Jesus, man who appointed me, the man is my emphasis, man who appointed me to judge or arbiter over you. Jesus opens this, this response with man. Most commentators agree that this is a less than cordial way to respond to someone. Man, what does this have to do with me? Some think that this man understood the role of rabbis in a dispute, and he thought that Jesus would interject. Maybe he knew that Jesus was more than qualified to judge such issues. But what we know that he doesn't understand, this is not the reason that Jesus has come to settle your personal issues regarding your inheritance. It's not about that. Can I remind you, Jesus is able to see your heart. Jesus is able to see why we come to events such as these, why we attend church services, why we pursue him. He is able to clearly show and see what's going on inside our heart. He knows the hearts of all men. I remind you in John chapter three of Nicodemus, master, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Nobody can do what you do, Jesus. Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not your issue. Your issue is Nicodemus, you must be He must be born again. And brothers and sisters, we've got to guard ourselves, especially in terms of material pursuit, that those things don't overshadow eternal pursuits, that those things don't weigh so heavy on us that we lose perspective of eternity or that we miss Jesus. Jesus says these words then in verse 15, speaking now to the crowd. Notice he says it to them. He's no longer addressing the man. He's addressing the entire group. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That gathering and garnering more things to ourselves does not give us an abundance. We see countless individuals who have gathered much to themselves, yet still felt empty at the end of the day. We have seen whole denominations and the church was here for a season of time. Thomas Aquinas in speaking with Pope Innocent II meets with him and he sees a rather large sum of money spread out before the Pope and the Pope says these words to him. You see, the church is no longer in that age where it says silver and gold have I none. To which Aquinas responds, true, Holy Father, neither can she say to the lame rise up and walk. The power has been sapped or had been sapped from the church because there was a fixation on riches. There was a fixation on possessions and land and accumulating more and more possessions for the church. And it sounded very spiritual, but the power of the church had been lost. Jesus in speaking to this entire crowd speaks to us as as individuals, as a denomination, as a church that we don't pursue greed, that we guard ourselves against every form of greed. Jesus is speaking to them all. He's speaking to us. He says, beware. This Greek word means to observe, to recognize, to perceive. Jesus challenges his hearers to recognize and be on guard. Take care, look out, avoid, flee from every form of greed and an inordinate desire for riches and for stuff. And we as American Christians are incredibly rich as compared to most of the world. We've got plenty of stuff, more than enough. But oftentimes we want more. We want more riches. We want our bank accounts to be more full. We want more and more and more. Greed, give me more. The Greek English lexicon of the New Testament defines this Greek word as a strong desire to acquire more and more and more material possessions or to possess more things than other people have. 
irrespective of need. What's, he, what's that talking about there? That you see a need that others may have. You look upon the world and they may, they may need, they may want, but yet I gather more and more to myself. Can, can I give us an example of that? Some of you probably will have no context for this. I'm guessing you, you probably won't. Toilet paper. Right? Uh, two months ago, if I would have said, man, hoard, gather your toilet paper. You'd have said, pastor has lost it. I always suspected he was a little off. He has definitely lost it now. Why would he be telling us, are we going to TP another church? Some of you don't know what TPing is. I was a master of it in high school. That's not why, right? Now we know the value, at least a few months ago. We, we found out the value of toilet paper, and we had to gather it to ourselves. Think of that. We, 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 have, we had to get nobody else. We can't worry about anyone else. When we became aware of that in various ways, bottles of water were being gathered, food was being gathered, couldn't go to the grocery store at times and find certain items because people were gathering things to themselves, irrespective of the need of someone else. Jesus says, guard against greed. And brothers and sisters, we too must guard against greed. It's a dividing line between the righteous and the unrighteous, between the holy and the evil, to those truly pursuing Christ and those living for the world. The book of Proverbs says these words in Proverbs 21, 26, all day long he craves for more, but the righteous gives without sparing. You know, people like that, all they want is more stuff. I gotta get more stuff, I need more. I've gotta gather more wealth, I've gotta keep working. I've, I can't retire, I can't quit, I can't stop. I must gather more stuff for me. Ephesians 5 verse five says, for this you know with certain that no immoral or impure person or covetous it's another word for greed. No covetous person or man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. What does that say? That if you're a greedy person, it reveals much about your heart, that you're not concerned about others and you're obviously not concerned about God. Beloved children of God, those called out of darkness into his marvelous light, please be on your guard against every form of greed. When one has an abundance, his life doesn't consist in those possessions. I'm amazed as we look at our world, how many people that we worship who are rich. Do you ever find yourself saying, I wish I was like them or I lived in that house? Some of you remember a television show that came out some years ago, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. This is Robin Leach. And he would go to a person's home and he would take us through their home. And I don't know about you, some of us would say, I want that pool. I want that bedroom. I want that kitchen. And we marvel at these people and we say, I want to be like this. We see such greed on display, but is that life, brothers and sisters, really worth living? Is that really what's considered a good life? Material wealth, material possessions, everything we see, everything we hear in our world, people idolize their stuff, their possessions their cars, their boats, their furnishings and clothing. They dream of living our lives in a different way that we're not content with what we have. Jesus says true life, real life does not con consist in the abundance of stuff. And Jesus goes on to say this parable in verses 16 through 19. And he told them a parable saying that the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Can you see him pictured sitting back, laying back, relaxing? And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You think he's got a smile on his face. You think his heart is bubbling forth. Man, this is the good life. Whoa, I love it. But verse 20, God's going to break in on him, right? But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Four points of this parable I want to see, I want to highlight, and uh, prayerfully we'll get that through in a timely fashion. I'm checking my time here to make sure we're good. Number one, we see the rich man's dilemma. Well, he's had a bumper crop there, we see in verse 16 and 17. Now, what is he going to do? 
he is going to build bigger barns. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. He's not content to say, hey, let me go and see if my neighbor needs something. Uh, let, let me go around through the village. Let me go down to the town square. Who can I serve? Who can I sit out beside my, uh, my property and say free? This is for you. That's not his concern. His dilemma is, I've got too much stuff. What do I do with it? Well, his decision is point number two. He says, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down these old barns and I'm going to build larger ones and I can store all my stuff, my grain and my goods. By the way, I'm going to talk to myself and I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you're pretty good. You've got some good things laid up for many years to come. Sit back and relax. Be at ease. Not just be at ease, but man, get you some good ribs and go get you some gluten-free bread. That's for all you gluten-free folks. Get your drink on. Go down the state stores, open up again. Go get you some wine, white, dry. Get whatever kind you want. Get you some dancers. Get you a hire a band. Be merry. Who's with me? Isn't that real living? Drink, song, food. Ha! <sighs> Five things we notice about this man's decisions and our decisions, by the way, brothers and sisters, also reveal about what's going on in our heart when we get our stuff. Five things. We're going to go through these real quick. Number one, he is self-centered. Look at what he says, I will. How many eyes do you see in there? He's talking to himself, my, I, it's all about me. He's incredibly self-centered. A person who is greedy, it's all about him. It's what can you do for me? How can you help me get more stuff? Number two, he's self-indulgent. I've got all these barns and grains. I want to get more stuff. I want to garner, garner more, more stuff so I can be more comfortable. I want to indulge myself. Some would say he's hedonistic. He's only living for pleasure. He's self-directed. I will say to my soul, he is a law unto himself. He is leaning on his own understanding. I'm going to talk to myself and I'm going to tell myself what to do. Some of us know how dangerous that is. Anybody, uh, have you taken your own advice on occasion? How's that worked out for you? Usually not very good. So he's self-centered. He's self-indulgent. He's self-directed. He's self-deceived. How's he self-deceived? I will say to my soul. I've got many years to go to come. I've got plenty of time. I've got time to eat and drink and be merry. I've, I've got plenty of time to enjoy all that I have gathered to myself. He's also self-satisfying. I don't need anyone else to give me pleasure. I don't need anyone else to bring me joy or happiness. I've got it all myself. Obviously, this man's decision reveals that he is not living for God. Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He is obviously living like there is no God. His primary concern is hanging on to all he has, how he can keep it. And his only worry is how can I make sure I never lose what I've gathered? Number three, we see the rich man's delusion. He says to his soul, he forgets who's really in control. He forgets who God is, as I've stated. He doesn't think about who God is. Number one, we see in his decision, he understands, or he doesn't understand, that God owns everything. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. God owns everything. God controls everything. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things which have ne not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God not only controls everything and owns everything, God provides everything. Proverbs 10 verse 22, it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. He should have been thanking God for all that he had, all the gifts that God had given him, all the material possessions that he had had up to that point. He should have been giving his wealth away, doing good for others, yet he only seeks himself. He doesn't understand that God provides everything. Every good thing, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. God provides his children good things. He has given us good things. He has given us a level of wealth and a level of materials. Why? That we might share it with others. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, he has given us the greatest gift of all that we are called to appreciate and to love. And what is that gift? His son, 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Isn't Christ incredibly indescribable? 
his son, the most benevolent, most glorious, most loving, the most wonderful gift ever given Jesus, a gift that it inspires us to continue to tell others about him. It's the wonderful gift from God. He has given us everything. Isaiah 9, verse 6, for a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his soldiers. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Of course, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but may have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but by the world, excuse me, but that the world might be saved through him. Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Romans 8, 32, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also him freely give us all things? God has given us a gift. He has provided for us, but this man can't see the gift that God has given. Can we, brothers and sisters, are we denying the God that purchased us, the God who has given us so much because we are so fixated on stuff? on the pursuit of stuff, on the pursuit of materials. Finally, we see here the rich man's demise. Verse 20, God comes a calling. Uh, there's one thing for sure, God's gonna come call for all of us, right? Uh, many have said we live in the dash. Mine is February 11th, 1967, dash. I don't know what the end date's gonna be. There is no guarantee that I'm going to make it home this afternoon. I live only a few blocks away, but God has not guaranteed. I should not uh, boastfully and pridefully say that I'm going to do. I don't know what God has for me this day. The rich man's demise, God steps in and says to this man. Now notice this. He doesn't recognize God. He doesn't know God. He's denying God, but God knows him. God understands his situation, but God says to him, look at these words. Pretty strong. You fool. The soul that was being protected, the soul that he was caring for, the soul that sought pleasure and a place of comfort is now required by God. God says, you fool. It reminds that Greek word, uh, it refers to someone who is mindless, lacking sense, ignorant. That's this man. He's foolish because life is short. See, we realize, brothers and sisters, we're sensible if we realize that this life doesn't last forever. We must consider what our life is going to be for the short time that God has given us. Life is fragile. I was talking to a brother the other day, and I said, have you ever had a near-death experience? And we were commenting and talking. I was like, man, I, I, I have on occasion. I about drowned when I was a kid. And, and I think of these times how quickly my life could have been gone. Like that. Psalm 39, verses 4 through 6, say these words, listen. Lord, make me know the end of my days. What is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days like handbrush and my life as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. <sighs> and we're gone. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. Think about all the stuff that people gather to themselves that someone else is going to spend, that someone else is going to enjoy. Two things that this man understands in his, in his uh, demise. Number one, he realizes that he's mortal. He's gonna die, as we all will. The life that he wanted to preserve is presented again before a holy God. Psalm 103, verses 15 and 16, as for man, his days are like grass as a flower of the field, so he flourishes, when the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. What is our life but a vapor, James says, that appears for a little time and then what? Vanishes away. It's gone. And I know when I was young, I'd look at our young people, and I, was, I used to think I'm going to live forever. And I used to think 50 was old. I've changed my thinking. I now say I'm a young man. And when I get 60, I'll say, I'm a young man. But I thought I'd live forever. I thought life was going to go on forever. But we're mortal, brothers and sisters. This man has not prepared. He does not understand his own mortality. Secondly, and more importantly, 
He doesn't understand that he's accountable. Your soul is required. Hebrews tells us it's appointed unto men once to die, and then after this, what? The judgment. Your soul is accountable for holy God. And here's, here's what's, and you guys know this. If you're speeding down, not that any of you ever do this, if you're speeding down some street and you get pulled over and the police officer says to you, or you say to the police officer, sir, I didn't know what the speed limit was in this area. He will generously say to you, oh, you didn't know. <laughs> go ahead and go. You, you didn't know. You're, you're 15 miles over the limit, but since you didn't know, I'm going to let you go. Anybody ever had those experiences? No, because they don't exist. This man doesn't recognize God's law, but God is going to hold him accountable to the law. His soul is required. God's going to hold him accountable for the things that he's done. Our lives are borrowed lives. God has given us this life. God has granted this life to do what? They're not our own. He has loaned them to us. Life is so uncertain. We hang on by a thread. At any moment, we might be called upon by God to meet him and to see him. That's why it's important that we understand with this gift of life that we're given, we are to love him and to love others. Jesus concludes with verse 21. So is the man, he's a fool, who stores up treasure for himself, who is not prepared and not rich toward God. So two things, brothers and sisters, I want to remind us. Number one, be on your guard against the wealth. We are all susceptible to chase it. We are all prone to wander towards materialism. Christians, the, some of the best Christians I know have wandered away because of wealth, because of money, because of the pursuit of wealth. And secondly, be rich toward God. Listen to Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. I think it gives us an idea of what it means to be rich toward God. You'll know Moses' story here. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Listen to this. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Well, what's the reward? The reward was the future of what God was going to give him by maintaining faith, by trusting in what God says. Being rich towards God, the the the. Posture of the heart reveals the true condition. It reveals whether we have love for ourselves and our possession or our love for God, whether we worship material things or worship God, whether we seek fulfillment in this life or in the life to come, whether we're storing up treasures for here that is going to pass away or we're storing up treasures in heaven where they'll be kept forever. Are we rich towards God? Being rich towards God is loving him with everything and serving others with the resources that he has given us. Being rich toward God. Be on guard, brothers and sisters, against every form of greed. And don't think as you sit here that this can't be me. That would never be me. I ask you on the handout that you have, what would you do if you had a bumper crop? Oh, maybe some of you aren't farmers, so let me change the illustration. What would you do if you got a a stimulus check, and it was for $100,000. Lean back in your chairs for a moment and just picture, what would you do with that $100,000? And since you're all in church, you would say, I'd pay off the debt. Debt free in 23 would be, right? Show, raise your hand so I can see who those people would be, because we're going to note, okay, get the camera, pan the camera. No, what would we really do with it? Is our immediate thought others? Is our immediate thought, what man, I would serve X. I would serve them with this. Or is it, I'm gonna do for me. I'm gonna go get me a new car. Now I gotta be honest. I would be tempted to get that 67 Mustang that I'm still waiting for. I would be tempted, but I am married so the temptation would be fleeting. What do I mean by that? Karen wouldn't allow it. So we'd have these temptations. That's why we must be on guard against every form of greed. And as you search your hearts this morning, how's God moving in your heart? What, what are the things that you're saying, you know what, in my life I've pursued this more than I've pursued the Lord. I get more excited when I see the fruit of my labor financially than I do the fruit of God's word. 
in the life of others. I'm more passionate about those things than I am about pursuing him. And let me close with this question. Is God really enough? If it all got stripped away and you just had Jesus, would that be enough? Is Jesus enough? Last, second to last question from that question. Does Jesus satisfy you? Is Jesus enough and is Jesus satisfying? I pray that he is. Come to me, all you who labor, all you who are heavy laden. Jesus says there in Matthew 11, and I will give you what? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus provides that comfort and I pray that satisfaction that material possessions could never, ever fulfill. Pursuing greed, endless pursuit, empty pursuit. You want to be satisfied, be satisfied in Christ, being satisfied in doing his will, being rich toward God. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, Lord, we all have been tempted to to want more stuff. Maybe some of us has, some of us have pursued it. Maybe some of us have actually given in to that temptation. Maybe we hold our material possessions, our four hundred one ks, our bank accounts with in high regard. We find such satisfaction and safety there, such peace. And while you don't condemn us for having riches, you do condemn condemn us for being greedy and not sharing that wealth with others. Lord, what are you calling us to do? What are you calling us to give away? Lord, I pray that uh, that conviction that we may have wouldn't just be a fleeting one, that we would take it serious, that we would truly let your word examine our hearts deeply. Is this me? Is this rich man me? Lord, teach me to number my days. Lord, let me be thankful and serve you and serve others with my possessions. Lord, we do that for your namesake and for your glory. May you have your way in our lives, God. We thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been now forever will be. Great thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning 
Blessings are mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by 